Hello and welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming tonight. I must say after Hannah's introduction, I can't say that the newspapers seem to think there is a more important topic in the world at the moment other than fidelity and affairs, as I think we've witnessed over the past few weeks. Nevertheless, I am Jenny Russell. I'm a columnist for the Evening Standard and the Sunday Times. And when I was asked to chair this, I thought about the remarkable fact that in my adult life as a journalist and political commentator, I don't think I've come across any topic that has the capacity to, re to divide and enrage people so much as the topic of how we should bring up our children. And even the current debates over affairs or whether Ken Clark should be sacked or whether Fabio Capello should beat him to it don't interest people half as much as the private question of whether they're bringing up their children properly. Are they best pushed to their limits? Or should they be left to their own devices to find out who they are as people, to investigate their own personalities, and to find their own codes of behavior? I have to say that um, for 18 months, I lost a friend after her small daughter turned up to my daughter's birthday party, and then proceeded to spend most of the party leaning over the table and scooping the icing off the top of the birthday cake with her fingers, and then licking them. And when I told her to stop and behave herself, my friend stormed out of the house and didn't come back again. And I have to say that in many years of debating race and class and politics and religion with my friends, I'd never lost one until that point. <laughs> the format of tonight is going to be that, as usual, I'm going to announce the results of the way you initially voted when you came into the hall. And I'll do that at the end of the opening speeches. And then we're going to take the second vote as the concluding speeches are being made and after the question and answer session from the floor. And I'd just like to remind you how, how to cast your vote in case you don't know. You tear your ticket in half and you put either the for or against slip into the ballot box, unless you're still undecided, in which case you post the entire ticket. Well, I can't really believe that there are going to be many of you who are undecided at the end of listening to tonight's panel, and I hope this is going to be a pretty contentious discussion. And the first speaker for the motion is Amy Chua, the Yale Law Professor, whose somewhat wry memoir of her fanatical Chinese parenting style, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, has been a sensational hit on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's made her a heroine to some people and a complete hate figure to others. And the most remarkable thing I find about this is that Amy says she had absolutely no idea that she was going to get any reaction to it. <laughs> She wrote it as a literary memoir and didn't foresee that people were going to take it up as a kind of personal stamp of approval or disapproval of the way they raised their own children. I must say, I think Amy's image of turning her small daughter out into the snow because she wouldn't do her piano practice is one that's pretty unforgettable. I'd now like to welcome Amy to start tonight's debate. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you all for coming this evening. Let me first very clearly state my position. To the extent that I believe Western parents don't know how to bring up children, I also believe Chinese parents don't know how to bring up children. We're all struggling to get it right. There are many ways of being a good parent, and I absolutely do not think that Chinese mothers are superior contrary to a certain newspaper headline that you may have seen, which I never approved and do not agree with. In fact, when it comes to child rearing, I think that Asia and the West have opposite problems. In general, Asian child rearing can be too strict, too harsh, and too stifling, whereas in general, I think Western parenting has become too permissive and too indulgent. And Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother is really about my own struggle to find a balance between Eastern and Western parenting. By way of quick background, I was raised myself by extremely strict, but also extremely loving Chinese immigrant parents. And the approach worked with me. I had a wonderful childhood, and to this day, I adore my parents. Um, we voluntarily vacation with them every chance we get, which I think is saying a lot. And I feel that I owe them everything, which is why, even though my husband is not Chinese, I wanted to raise my own two daughters, Sophia and Lulu, the same way that my parents raised me. With my first daughter, Sophia, things went smoothly, and I got cocky. But then, 
my second daughter, Lulu, came along, and I got my comeuppance. She is a real fireball. We have very similar personalities. I feel she was born saying no. We locked horns from day one, and the book is actually filled with zany showdowns. I want to just uh, say I never put my daughter out in the cold. Actually, what happened is I said, if you don't stop banging on the piano, I'm going to put you out there in the cold. And Lulu, true to her personality, stepped out and faced me defiantly. And the end of that chapter is me bribing her back with hot chocolate and marshmallows to make her come back in. Um, so we fought a lot, but she always came back. But then at age 13, something very different happened. Lulu rebelled, not in a funny way. She became very angry, very alienated, seemed to turn against everything I stood for. And the climax of my book is a terrible public fight in Moscow, Red Square. I'm not going to give it away, but the most uh, terrible things that have ever been said to me were said there. Um, and Lulu threw a glass, broke a glass, and said, I, you know, I hate you. I hate this family. You're a terrible mother. You're selfish. Everything you say you do for me is actually for yourself. You make me feel terrible about myself. So for those of you who haven't read the book, I'm pretty tough on myself. Um, but it was a horrible uh, experience. And at that very moment, it suddenly uh, hit me that, oh my god, I might lose my daughter. And when that hit me, nothing else mattered. I don't care about school or grades or the violin. And that's when I changed. Uh, not completely. Um, I still refuse to compromise on academic uh, excellence and many things, but I pulled back. I let Lulu drop the violin to do what she wanted, which at the time was to play tennis. I really loosened up socially. She has a Facebook, an iPod. Uh, the kids had four sleepovers in the last two months, um, something I'm not happy at all about. So Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother is the story of my own journey as a mother. It was never intended to be a parenting guide or a sally into the mommy wars. With all that said, the book does have a point of view. While I certainly have regrets, if I had to raise my girls all over again, I would basically do the same thing with some adjustments. So um, I'm not saying it's for everyone, but I'm a proud, strict mom, taken down a few notches, proud of the daughters I raised, and proud of my relationship with them. What I want to do now is switch gears and address some of uh, the weaknesses that I see in Western parenting. First, on the point of self-esteem. Western parents spend a lot of time worrying about this, but I'm not really sure they know how to instill it. I think we do our children a disservice when we praise them, when they know they haven't put in their best effort, or when we give them trophies, when they haven't accomplished anything. That doesn't give them real inner strength. Real self-esteem has to be earned by overcoming a challenge or mastering something. Jokes about A pluses and gold medals aside, for me, in the end, it's not about grades or achievement. It's about believing in your child more than anyone else, not letting them give up even when they want to, and helping them see that they are capable of more than they think. Second, on the point of choice and freedom. Whereas I think Asian parenting tends to give children too little choice, I think Western parents tend to give children too much choice, particularly when they're very young. If you give a six or seven-year-old uh, the choice to pursue their passions on any given day, that passion is going to be probably playing video games and eating candy all day. Very young children are not mature enough to know what's best for them. I remember once Lulu came home from school with a bad math test. She was about seven years old. And she came home and announced, I hate math. I'm bad at math. Now, I think a lot of Western parents, I know this because this is my husband, uh, would say, don't worry, Lulu. You don't need to be good at math. You could be good at something else. Not everybody has to be good at math. I went the other way. I said, no way. How do you know? You, of course you're good at math. And I wrote up all these practice tests, uh, and we drilled them. I had a stopwatch <laughs> every night for one week. Uh, it wasn't Guantanamo Bay. It was just one week. 
And after that, uh, the next test, one week later, she actually did very well on her test. And then she decided that she quite liked math. And today, at 15, math is her favorite subject. One of the reasons that my husband, who was raised completely differently, supported my strict parenting is because he was actually somebody who wished his parents had forced more things on him. He remembers when he was about eight and his mom gave him the choice. Do you want to learn to play the violin or go play with your friends? Go play with my friends. Um, he also wishes that somebody had forced him to learn a second language. When we got married, he got the language tapes. Didn't work. It's really hard to learn Chinese at age 30. Third, I think that Western parenting, or at least the mommy wars, is often based on false dichotomies. There's a tendency in these parenting wars to boil everything down to black or white. Do you want success for your kids or happiness? Do you want to be a strict parent or let your kids have fun? Do you want them to drill and work hard or do you want them to be creative? And I think these are false choices and not helpful. And I think they tend to give parents the easy way out. Take happiness. If I had a magic button and I could choose either happiness for my children or success, I would choose happiness in a second. That's a no-brainer. I just think that it's more complicated. I do not believe that if you say to your children, do whatever you want, pursue your passions, I love you, that that will necessarily lead to happier adults, and I don't even think it necessarily leads to happier children. In all the Western nations, we have very high rates of teenage depression, teenage alcohol and substance abuse, and teenage pregnancy. And in general, I think these are problems of too little structure, not too much, and they do not lead to happiness. Another false dichotomy, creativity or practice and hard work. Obviously, we want both, particularly in America. I think there's a tendency to romanticize creativity. Just give your kid a saxophone and amazing jazz will pop out. Especially areas with math, like math and music, you need to have basic skills first. Before you can come up with string theory or the theory of relativity, you need to know how to multiply really well. Before you can play an amazing Mozart concerto, brilliantly and emotionally and passionately, you need to be able to play in tune. You need those basic foundations first. I want to wrap up uh, by saying that I didn't write this book to have foreign policy implications. Uh, those are my two previous books, which nobody ever read. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, like it or not, um, child rearing, in fact, is inextricably linked to the future of nations. And I have no doubt, I've been thinking, how could this happen to me, why? I have no doubt that at least part of the reason for the firestorm, at least in the United States, is that my book accidentally tapped into two of America's deepest anxieties, fear of parenting and fear of China. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But China, has, but China has anxieties too. You might be amused to know that my book, with no words changed, is being marketed in China in exactly the opposite way. In fact, uh, I'm a lawyer. When I first saw the cover of my book, I thought, oh my god, I need to bring a lawsuit to uh, bring an injunctive relief. Because I looked at the cover, and the Chinese title of my book is Parenting by a Yale Law Professor, Raising Kids in America. And there's a picture of me in a red, white, and blue flag. And so I asked my Chinese friends, I said, this is, I can't take this, this is terrible. But talking to a lot of Chinese people, they explained to me and convinced me that it's actually not a bad title. The reason for that is because all of the things that are so outraging the Western audiences, you know, uh, drilling math and piano to, um, uh, uh, you know, two hours a day, no play dates or sleepovers, they never even heard of these things. Um, are, are not even controversial. I mean, that's it's not even considered strict. I think you'll be, um, so for them, it's the last part of the book. You know, this, see, this woman learned to give her kids more choice and more freedom, and things came out well, so that's uh, how the book is being pitched. I'm sort of the cuddly mom over there. <laughs> um, the, uh, done? 
Okay, great. Let, let me just, so the key takeaway point, uh, am I done with 10 minutes or 12? Oh, 12, okay. So let me just, uh, the key point I wanna make here is that China is trying to learn from the West. And I think instead of being complacent, we should try to learn from China too. Um, to conclude then, I just wanna ask everybody here tonight to think back to your own parents or grandparents or the generation that survived wartime Europe. What do you think those parents were like? I bet they didn't sugarcoat or spend their whole time arranging play dates. For them, parenting was about preparing kids for the future to ensure that they would have a better life. After all, the British education system was one of the envies of the world. And perhaps it's time to reclaim those traditional British values of discipline, rigor, hard work, and respect for excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. That was extremely amusing. And did you notice she reclaimed her character? <laughs> um, the first speaker against the motion is Justine Roberts, um, the ex-banker who started a mother's website, Mumsnet, in her back room after her babies were born, and who now finds herself one of the most famous and influential women in Britain. Every political leader courted that website at the last election, and Justine's just published um, a new book of which she is the co-author, The Mum's Net Rules, which is aimed at parents who would like to navigate parenting without losing either their cool or their sanity. Justine. Thank you. Well, I should start by saying, having spent a futile 30 minutes trying to prize my five-year-old away from Angry Birds this morning and towards his cornflakes, that I am very, very strongly tempted to cross the floor and join Amy's team. <laughs> Um, but fortunately, there are plenty of other Western parents out there, some of you in the audience, no doubt, uh, who are far better role models than me, and I will speak, I hope, on your behalf. Um, so yes, if we judge um, ourselves by the number of musical prodigies we produce and the number of mass whizzes, Asian parents are beating us hands down. There's no doubt about it. And I agree with Amy, who does not regret Giving, not practicing their instrument more. Who amongst us wishes perhaps they hadn't given up uh, at the first chance? And who doesn't think that they might have got better grades if the, either their teachers or their parents had pushed them a bit more? But we know in our bones that there is more to life than A grades. Uh, and most of us, I think, would count a happy childhood as being one of the best gifts, gifts we could bestow on our children. And on that, we're not doing too badly. Now, a, a survey of British teens recently found that seven out of 10 were very satisfied. Very satisfied. How many teens do you know who are very satisfied about anything? They were very satisfied about their lives. In contrast, South Korea has the highest rate of teen depression in the OECD, and the biggest killer of 17 to 24-year-olds in South Korea, which I have to say are, are kind of the most tigerish of all the tiger nations, as far as parenting is concerned, is suicide. Uh, you know, it's no joke, this. One third of chi Chinese primary school children suffer from psychological ill health, acor according to a recent survey, and that's caused, they say, by classroom pressure and parental, uh, parental stress. Um, so it must be said, you know, I personally might swap a little bit of psychological ill health for a few fewer renditions of chopsticks paid ever more badly, but... You know, when, relatively speaking, I don't think we're doing that badly. Quite apart from being a good parent, you know, um, you know, quite a large part of it, I agree with Amy, is preparing our children for the future. And some of that does involve learning skills, yes, the mass of music, but only some of it. Imagination, creativity, critical thinking, and social skills are important. And evidence shows that rote learning really does... Um, Yes, it results in proficiency, but it doesn't do much for creativity. Uh, a recent survey of 29 countries that, that found the Chinese came first in terms of their calculation skills, but they came last for imagination. The Chinese way um, is one of obsessing about perfection. In Amy's book, she talks about only top of the class is acceptable. Gold medal is the only medal I will accept. 
nothing but A grades. Uh, but if you chase perfection, the chances are you're going to be quite risk averse. Um, if all that matters in life is scoring top marks, when will you ever take a chance? Now, this Tory government is very fond of telling us that the only way we will get out of our current economic mire is by entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs will help us escape, and entrepreneurs are risk takers. We need risk takers, we need innovators. And if you look at this country, three of our most famous businessmen, entrepreneurs, uh, Richard Branson, Alan Sugar, Simon Cowell, barely got a GCSE between them. <laughs> and who, who wouldn't want to produce Simon Cowell? I mean, he's, he's very nice to his mum, I'm told. <laughs> it's silly to suggest that we're perfect in the West. I wouldn't pretend that for a second. Yes, we struggle to get our kids off Facebook, off Angry Birds and onto the piano stool. And some of us, quite frankly, hanker after the old days where we could say, you do it because I told you say. Um, but the answer is not authoritarian parenting. It's not right to control through shame, which is some of the approach that Amy advocates in her book. Instead, what the Mumsnetters would suggest in the collective wisdom of the Mumsnet rules is an approach of authoritative parenting. This does emphasize high standards. We agree, you should have manners. You should be diligent. You should even ask your children to do some chores around the house and start them early. But it's accompanied by parental warmth. And yes, I'm afraid it's accompanied by a commitment to reasoning. Unless, of course, they're arguing for a guinea pig, in which case no amount of reasoning should prevail. <laughs> Frankly, tiger parenting is just not viable in our modern democratic individualistic society. Believe me, I've tried it now and then, and invariably I get confronted with children who say they're about to call the social services, <laughs> uh, at the same time giving an impassioned speech about the rights of man. But on balance, wouldn't you rather that? Wouldn't you rather have children with a strong sense of themselves, with confidence uh, in their own worth? I know I would, even if sometimes I wish they would practice the piano more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. The second speaker for the motion is someone who's never been surprised when his views have caused controversy. Theodore Dalrymple is the pseudonym of Anthony Daniels, and he's a doctor who for 15 years wrote witty, savage, and often deeply depressing accounts <laughs> of the lives of his underprivileged patients in the pages of The Spectator. And his despair about the gulf which he clearly saw between the values that he was brought up with and those which he thought he saw being espoused in the people around him was absolutely evident. But equally evident, and for some readers as a very uncomfortable juxtaposition, was the contempt in which it was felt he held some of those people. Theodore is the author of Spoilt Rotten, the Toxic Cult of Sentimentality. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I first realized that there was something wrong with the way uh, we bring up our children, of course, other than my own childhood. Um, and I must here tell you about a friend of mine, who, a Russian, who went to live in America. And he, at, at his parties, at parties, he always introduced himself and said, uh, hello, I'm such and such. I, I hate my parents, don't you? And uh, he never found anybody who uh, didn't hate their parents. Uh, but there, I first realized that there was something wrong when a friend of mine who was working in pediatrics uh, told me that a mother had come to him asking uh, for his help. Doctor, she said, uh, can't you do something about Johnny? He's terrible. He smashes things. He won't do what he's told. And you should hear his fucking language. <laughs> Well, I had a, a not dissimilar experience shortly afterwards. A patient came to me. She had a son with her who just had his uh, third birthday. And there wasn't anyone who could look after him at that moment, so she had to bring him into my room. 
And the child was not surprisingly restless and started to pick up things from the, uh, from the desk. And she said, put that down. And put it down. Picked up something else. She said, put that down. And uh, he put it down. And then finally he picked up the telephone. And she said, put that down. And he looked at her. Bear in mind, he's just had his third birthday. He turned to her and with sheer malignity in his eyes said, well, fuck you. <laughs> Now, of course, these are mere anecdotes. Uh, but if you listen to the children coming out of the school in the little market town in which I live when I'm in England, uh, which is prosperous and without uh, the grossest social problems, uh, you can hear the same kind of thing. And uh, what is symptomatic is that uh, uh, when children are on the street in any numbers, when they come out of school, uh, adults shrink away half in fear and half in disgust. And this is not imaginary. I will take you and show you. And incidentally, I was uh, just uh, lying down in my uh, bedroom here in um, uh, South Kensington, and I heard the children coming out. And the average British child, it seems to me, cannot go further than about 10 yards without an expletive. It's kind of rocket fuel for him. And, the, and I also saw in a little supermarket, because I'd forgotten to buy some razors, uh, bring some razors, uh, a French mother, obviously very well off, actually fighting with her child in the, in the supermarket. And the security person in this uh, uh, supermarket told me that this was by no means uncommon. Now, it's obviously not true that no parents bring up their children well in the West, and obviously many do. So I'm asking you to consider this motion not statically, but dynamically, in terms of trends rather than the current state. And I shall also refer to Britain, both because I know it best, and because uh, Britain is in the uh, forefront or vanguard of almost anything that is undesirable. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, other countries uh, tend to move in our direction rather than the other way. Well, consider this. What, what does it mean that more than a third of children in this country never eat a meal at a table with another member of their family, or perhaps I should say household? I used to go into houses when I was practicing as a doctor, and there were many such houses in which not only was there no cooking apparatus, unless you count a microwave oven as cooking apparatus, but there was no single piece of furniture at which people could have eaten together. And that's over a third of children in this country. And this is not a small matter because, of course, eating together is one of the most elementary and I think important uh, manners of socialization of learning to control one's appetite and behavior for the sake of others. And it's not available to a very considerable proportion of the population uh, of children in this country. It's hardly surprising, then, that so many of them are fat. And this obesity is a manifestation simultaneously of overindulgence and neglect. You could say overindulgence as neglect or ne neglect as overindulgence. Overindulgence because no attempt is made to rein in their appetites, and neglect because such reining in is very difficult, it's painful, it requires training and discipline, and it's usually on the part of the mother, but also on the part of the father. Again, children in Britain are, by the end of their childhood, nearly twice as likely to have a television in their bedroom as a father living at home. Is this not also a sign of indulgence and neglect? Of course, not every such um, upbringing ends in disaster, either social or psychological or economic or anything like that, because human beings are very resilient uh, creatures. But this is surely far from good let alone optimal. If you look around many, perhaps most of our schools, 
you will find the surroundings astonishingly littered. The reason that no one in this room litters is not because each time he or she has a piece of potential litter in his or her possession uh, and, and he makes a decision not to litter by means of a deduction from a Cartesian first principle which is indubitable. It is because his mummy told him or her not to and instilled it into him or her. Well, wherever you go in this country, as it happens, I've just written a book about this, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, litter. And if you want to see uh, the Ne Plus Ultra of it, I recommend the A14 between the M6 and Huntingdon. <laughs> it's truly astonishing. Each piece of litter, and there are millions of them, is a kind of material trace of deficient socialization. I am amused but also despairing when I see the children in my town approach a litter bin with a piece of litter and then as if they knew that litter bins had something to do with litter but they couldn't quite work out what it was, <laughs> they drop it, not in it, but by it. <laughs> in other words, uh, civilized or civic conduct in this country is a kind of faint memory. It's a bit, it's a bit like what uh, somebody uh, one of my patients said when I asked him who Shakespeare was, he said, it rings a bell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'll, uh, uh, when someone in my town complained of uh, the litter around the school, the school instituted litter studies if we take education in this country, we spend £60,000 per head on education, uh, on compulsory education, or I should say attendance at school. And yet 25%, about 25% of our children turn out illiterate and innumerate, or barely literate and barely innumerate. There is no protest about this whatsoever. And if a teacher should should draw attention, and no doubt he uses very bad methods in teaching, but nevertheless, if he draws attention to some deficiency in school, he is more likely to be attacked by the parents than the parents are, are likely to try and do anything uh, about the child. And in this country, a recent survey showed that 10% of headmasters has, have been physically attacked in the last year uh, by, uh, by parents or what are known as car carers of children. If you take again uh, the, uh, the lack of protest about this terrible deficiency, it is not that mothers do not protest. In this country, if you see a paedophile being brought to court, there are often large numbers of, uh, of mothers with terrified children in tow screaming for the death of the paedophile. But if you look at the, uh, the story of the Soa murderer, what it revealed, what was interesting about that, was what it revealed about the murderer's relations with many children before and the complicity of parents in what he had done. In, for example, a uh, the mother of a 12-year-old refused to cooperate with the police uh, in investigating illegal sexual relations with her. So, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I will say taken in the round, there is plenty of reason to support this evidence if you do not take it too literal-mindedly. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore. And the final speaker against the motion is Frank Furedi, who is the provocative pr professor of sociology at the University of Kent. And Frank is a slightly unusual academic in that he's actively interested in taking academic debates and bringing them out into the public arena. He's particularly interested in the whole questions of authority and parenting and how we manage the relationships between children and adults in a suspicious society. He's the author of 13 books, including Paranoid Parenting. Frank. Thank you very much, Jenny. Good evening, everybody. I, I don't know if you noticed, but whenever it comes to a discussion on parenting, everybody feels that they got a warrant to take their own personal story and to recast it as a grand philosophy. 
And on no other issues are we allowed to communicate such prejudices and such stereotypes as we do in relation to parenting. So Theodore happened to hear a couple of children swearing, and it's concluded that has never happened before in British society. You know, children of my generation would never use a four-letter word. That was unthinkable. Uh, whereas now what we have is this epidemic, this pathology of children going around and swearing. And, and, and because of that, uh, sort of obviously British parents are not doing their bit. Amy, on the other hand, concludes that in Western societies, children have too much choice. In fact, they have so much choice in Britain that middle-class children in London have literally their entire life organized for them by their parents. From the moment they get up in the morning for the first set of activities, as they kind of transfer around by their parents from this activity to the next, literally they got no free time to be children and to relax. The idea that somehow we live in a world where children have these incredible choices, you know, so parents are laid back, chilled out, just get on with it, is a myth that bears literally no relationship to reality. And I think it's important to realize that uh, you know, when we're talking about Western parenting, you know, uh, what we are really talking about is intensive parenting. Western parenting is phenomenally intensive. Parents spend far more time with their children today than they did in any other generation. A, a working mother in the 21st century in Britain spends about two, three hours more a day looking after her children than a mother who stayed at home in the 1970s. That's how intensive it really is. And I think what's very interesting is that all these so-called Asian attributes that are brought out in Amy's books are not Asian at all. I mean, anybody that's been, been to New York, Westchester County, been to Cambridge, Massachusetts, will recognize those characteristics straight away. Just to give you an example of how this works, uh, the other day a friend of mine who lives in New York uh, told me a story about how her four-year-old child has been on this waiting list for this high-powered preschool nursery. A waiting list. And, and she's been on it for months and months and months, and she really was at a loss to know how she could, you know, sort of train her child to get into a nursery so she can play with toys and, and develop. <laughs> and at first, I thought she was exaggerating the way most parents do. So I went online, and I discovered this uh, online service, which is called How to Ace at a Preschool Interview. <laughs> this is in, in New York. Right, this, is not Chinese, this is not an online service for Chinese people or for Cambodian refugees. This is addressed towards Westerners. It, this is what they say. Education nowadays starts even before kindergarten, like age three months. The best and the most elite preschools don't just have expensive tu tuition, they have long waiting lists of eager parents who would love to send their children they're in a heartbeat. If you're lucky enough to have a preschool call you and your child for an interview, you should do everything in your power to give the best possible impression. Now that kind of intensive, high-powered parenting would be familiar to anybody that lives in Northern Lon North London, as it would be in most middle-class neighborhoods throughout the country. In, in, in London, as far as I can tell, there seem to be more tutors of young children than rats these days. But literally, literally everybody I know has got, a, has got a tutor working for them. So that's on, the, on this kind of stereotype that we're very laid back and relaxed. We care about self-esteem. We, you know, we don't let, you know, we kind of allow children to make too much choices. And then the other side of the stereotype is that in China or in Asia, parents are really hard-assed. I mean, they really, they, they would never dream of spoiling a child. The fact that there are these little emperors in China and that there's been a, a protracted debate in China about how children are spoiled by their parents, a debate that's been going on for a very, very long time, um, it, it just happens to be a, a, an awkward fact. And if you happen to have gone to Shanghai or if you go to Beijing, you'll find that the equivalent of the Westchester mummies and the Islington daddies in China have entire, exactly the same parenting style Maybe they say it in the Chinese language that I don't English, as they do here. So it seems to me that what we're discussing at the moment are essentially two middle-class approaches towards parenting, rather than anything that is culturally different from one another. 
So it's very easy to get confused in the debate. My argument is simple and straightforward. Western parents are actually quite good at parenting. It's not rocket science. You don't need a PhD in development psychology to be a good mom or, or a good dad. There's no problem with Western parents. The real problem is that we do everything possible to make it very difficult for parents to have confidence in making judgment calls. We make it very, very difficult for parents to live the life of, of being a good parent because all of their intuition, all of their, all of their way, uh, approaches towards life is continually undermined. So what are the problems, with, 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 with the problems that we face? The first problem that we face in the West and Western culture is that we devalue parental competence. Time and time again, we continually pathologize what parents do. Politicians of all political parties seem to die not on, on, on lecturing parents about their failures. And I, I can still see the moment, I think it was either David Cameron, but it could have been Gordon Brown, because <laughs> on this they're at one, you know, they are totally together on this particular kind of issue. I remember that typical you know, sort of presidential lecture where you, know, you get that kind of look on their, that pained look on their face, they, that passionate care, that really pained look as they say, you know, you know, Jim, this is on the Today program, parenting is probably the most difficult job in the world. <laughs> right? And everybody gives them a standing ovation because we, you know, it's such an obvious thing. Parenting is the most difficult job in the world. Well, actually, it isn't. <laughs> I tell you, if, if, you know, being a, a nuclear physicist is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult than, than being a parent. Being a, you know, sort of a, like a Formula One driver, on balance, is a bit more complex <laughs> than changing the nappies of your son. Right? But the very idea that we say parenting is the most difficult job in the world, which sounds really good, it, it's meant to say, meant to t communicate the idea that, that I feel for you, you know, I take this very seriously, is actually another way of saying that you mom over there and you dad over there are unlikely to be up to this very difficult job. <laughs> right? You mom and you dad need a phenomenal amount of parenting advice. You need a, a posse of experts to come in and hold your hands and give you what, what Cameron and Brown always call support. <laughs> right? So it seems to me that what we have in, under these circumstances are these very helpful reminders that tell us how difficult parenting is, which then makes parents very insecure, which then leads to what I think is the, the real problem, is that when there are so much pressure on parents, to do this very difficult job, what they invariably do is begin to live their life through their children. And as you live your life through your children, you begin to lose sight of just what it is uh, that you ought to be doing. And because you live your life through your child, your parenting style becomes synonymous with your identity. And I think that's the really sad, tragic thing about the world that we live in. We forget about the real job of child rearing and we become much more concerned about parenting as a cultural accomplishment of identity construction. And the reason why we have these debates, and we have debates around dinner tables all the time, is because these days when your identity as a parent is so much part of who you are, you cannot simply say, well, Amy brings her child up this way. That's cool. I don't like it, but that's her business, right? Justine brings up her kid that way. Yeah, well, you know. Bit slack, not what I would do, but, but fine, <laughs> you know. Instead of saying, I'm just leaving it at that, we do it differently, because maybe our children are different, our circumstances are different. We need to make a political issue out of who we are as parents. And the more we make a political issue out of who we are as parents, the more we take our eyes of the real job, which is just looking after our kids in the best way that we can. And I think that on a good day, Western parents do that really, really well. And the problem is not the fact that Western parents cannot bring up their kids. The real problem is that because of all these pressures that I've described, Western parents have lost the capacity to chill out, relax, and get a life. Thank you.
Thank you, Frank. Well, from the whoops of applause that greeted that last contribution, you might be unsurprised to know that in the pre-vote, the, the number of people voting for the motion was 149. The number against was 325. But the don't knows amount to 194, so there are an awful lot of people to be swayed over the next 25 minutes. Um, I'd like to start by uh, dimming the lights slightly so that I could see the audience, because now it's time for questions, but at the moment the lights are so bright that I can't quite make anybody out. Um, there are a couple of ushers who have got microphones, um, and we're going to take questions in threes. And it would be great if you could just say briefly who you were, but apart from that, please keep your questions very brief and to the point, and don't make statements, because I'll just have to move on. Um, could we start with anyone who'd like to speak raising their hands? No one's got anything to contribute. <laughs> um, somebody right at the back there. Hello, um, my name's Josephine. I'm a parent to a seven-year-old uh, girl. And I just wanted to read and tell some stories. And I just wanted to ask um, a question, actually. So I do think that there is um, a sort of tendency for us to sort of say that we don't want to impose too much on our children, and I think we do it in education as well. Um, do you think that there's a tendency nowadays to um, make children make decisions, work out their own risks and all this kind of thing? And actually what we're doing is we're creating, uh, we're sort of saying, well, we can't do it ourselves, so we'll let the children do it. And um, we're creating a nation of warriors in our own children. Thank you very much, Josephine. Is there another hand? Gentleman here in the middle. And another one after that? Thank you. Uh, this question is for Amy. I had a tiger mom. And I was actually wondering, um, looking back, how would you recommend um, encouraging your children to follow their passions, but still, um, I guess, having that rigorous high-level achieving type of an attitude. Thank you. And um, young boy I over here. I just wanted to ask, do you think that achieving academically is as um, good as achieving, like, socially? Is that a question for anyone in particular? Um, no, I just wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Amy, do you want to start, to start out? What would be the new revised Tiger Mothering? Um, well, in the end, I actually do think that... Uh, having your kids follow their passions is the most important thing. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I guess where I would differ with a lot of Western parents is I don't always assume, especially when kids are little, that they know exactly what that passion is going to be. Um, you know, I know if you ask my uh, children, my girls, you know, their best, all of their friends at around age 12, they all want to be Hollywood film producers and rock stars. And I wouldn't be against that. I think those are actually great passions, but they're, they're hard, those are hard to achieve too, you know? So, um, but to answer your question, I, you know, I don't, I'm still struggling with this myself. Um, Lulu wanted to play tennis instead of violin, and it really broke my heart because she was a beautiful and very emotional violin player. And all I can say is maybe it's about instilling those early skills uh, at a young age so that they kind of have rigor and focus, and then letting them just kind of out to uh, pursue, to make their own choices later. Um, a nice compliment I got from her coach was, uh, you, know, that, you know, your kid has a great work ethic. She never blames anybody. She really just keeps at it. She doesn't give up. So I was thinking, wow, maybe, you know, Chinese parenting did work with Lulu after all. And I started getting all excited. I started, you know, like making calls. And uh, she said, lay off, mommy. You know, I don't need you. Um, uh, this is my thing. So, so I'm still looking for that right balance. Amy, just to pick up that, do you think that achieving academically is as important, more important than achieving socially? You kept your children away from play dates and so on for much, many of their years. Did that matter? I, I actually think that socialization uh, is extremely important. And I think that in China, this is a real problem. Or I've seen kids that look like their parents. I agree with Frank. They're just hovering over them. They can't do anything. Um, I don't tend to think that this is the main problem we have in the West. So my, you know, I think we've over-exaggerated the need to kind of sculpt, uh, you know, how much playtime. When I was little, we just played outside and the neighbors, uh, you know, and the States, there's a lot of playtime at school. 
and my kids actually did have plenty of play dates and playground things before, you know, when they were very little. It's only between the ages of eight and 14, which is a lot of years, that I would say they had far few sleepovers and play dates. They had tons of friends, tons of friends at school, you know, these camps, these music camps, these sports things. Um, so I think socialization, it, I actually agree that it's equally important. I've seen it. Um, but, uh, but I think maybe, again, it's Asia and the West have gone too far in opposite extremes. That, you know, Asia might have to worry about this. Can we produce leaders that can function and, and be, you know, be funny and humorous and have initiative? But I, I just think that that's not our main weakness, that uh, we don't have enough play dates. Frank, you want to just come in quickly? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, it's not right to, to talk about socialization and education, academic education, in the same breath for a very simple reason that parents are the worst teachers for their children. I mean, I don't know if you ever, any of you ever ski and, 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 and watched parents trying to teach their kids how to ski. And they're so emotionally involved in the whole process that they, they, can, they just kind of lose control over, over the whole thing because they, there's too much involved. And similarly, parents who do a lot of homework with their kids end up losing sight of their own needs from that of the child. And that's why I would argue that yeah, academic stuff is important but leave that to teachers and to schools and to universities. On the other hand, parents are indispensable for giving kids very clear cues and signals about how to make their way in the world. And what parents can be very good at is socializing children to communicate values to them, to show them how you engage in awkward situations. And I think uh, to that extent, we should be very, very clear that parenting really works well when it's discreet, when it's about child rearing. The more we load on to parenting, you know, when parents become therapists and teachers and philosophers and all the rest of that, mentors, the more parenting becomes denuded of any real content. And I think that's the best way of, of seeing the two. Justine, what do you think about that? And what do you think about the idea that we're loading too many choices onto children? Um, I think, you know, I, mean, I hate to disagree with my own side. Oh, no, free country. <laughs> but I would just say that I think it's impossible not to be a mentor as a parent and in some way to be a therapist. I mean, uh, you know, it's you who's going to be there at 11.30 at night when they're sort of worried about their boyfriend or whatever. But that's a, only a slight disagreement, Frank, very broadly. <laughs> we are a team. Um, on, the, uh, on the sort of choice question... Um, I think actually choice on, on the whole empowers a child. I think if you're talking about causing angst and worry, uh, you know, choosing your child's GS, GCSEs and making them do physics when they'd rather do art, that probably causes a lot more angst. Um, but I do think there is a limit to choice. And I kind of agree, I think, with the sense I get from Amy that, you know, we can give our choice, uh, our, our young kids too much choice. Um, I know this from personal experience when my five-year-old son chose to go to school in a gypsy skirt um, and um, he never did again after that horrible day but I possibly shouldn't have allowed that to happen and certainly most of the other parents at the school thought I'd made a terrible choice there myself. Thank you. Can we take another round of questions? If there's anyone on the balcony, oh yes I can see someone right there. There's a static microphone there. Would you like to come forward to it? And then, um, I can't, sorry I can't quite see you, but do come up and line up behind this speaker. Um, and you there. Go ahead. Hi, Elizabeth Waterhouse. Really just addressing the panel. I've just heard talk of over-involved, under-involved parents. And really, I don't know if anyone could inform me um, with regards to mental ill health in children, statistically, West versus East. That's it. Thank you. practical question I have two kids one five and one seven and I would bring in a new sort of uh, uh, idea to the whole debate ambition because I want my children to be the best but I don't want them to be the best because they're afraid of me or because I was up until midnight with them but uh, the question would be can you teach ambition and if you can how how do you make children to be ambitious so that they strive for the best because of their own good not because of an external pressure. Wow, effortless achieving ambition. Hmm. <laughs> That's a holy grail. I look forward to the answers. Hi, I'm Viv Groskop. Um, I'm a writer and mother of three children, which I've recently discovered is an answer to the question, how many children? It's too many children. <laughs> 
bit late to find that out. Um, I wanted to pick up on what Theodore Dalrymple said um, about the man who asked everyone, um, I, I hate my parents, don't you too? Isn't this whole debate really about our greatest fear, which is accepting the inevitable that our children will hate us? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Theodore, I think I'm going to start with you as a doctor who ought therefore to know about statistics on mental health and perhaps answers to all the rest too, I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't actually know the statistics a, a, a about this and in any case child psychiatry is such a woolly subject that I, I wouldn't put much trust in them. All I can say is that in France they have the highest consumption of, um, uh, of psychotropic medicine in the world by quite a long way. Um, as far as uh, parents um, uh, inevitably being hated by, uh, by their uh, children, I thought I was pessimistic, but um, <laughs> I, I yield there. You yield to this. I yield to that kind of pessimism. Um, so, um, And I, how, how do you instill some, an effortless sense of ambition? Well, I don't, I don't, uh, that's a very difficult uh, question because I don't think it's merely a question of what adults, uh, parents do. It, it's, a, it's much more uh, socially, um, uh, socially uh, constructed than that. And that, that uh, if you live in, in a large, uh, in large parts of Britain, for example, there is no ambition other than to be a footballer or a um, or, or to be a pop star. And when they talk about talent, that is what that is what they mean by talent. Um, so I think that it would be very difficult for parents I in those circumstances to to. So I, I, I think that is a very difficult. Amy, do you have some quick uh, response to yeah, that one? I have a, a very, um, on the, our, our children will inevitably hate us. Uh, I just have such a different uh, <laughs> worldview. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's just a falling into Frank's trap, my own. It's just one case of one. But, um, but you know, I absolutely adore my parents. And uh, my father's actually here this evening. And we, my kids absolutely love my parents. And... We really do vacation together. I'm literally, every vacation we take, we include my parents. So uh, I just don't have such a bleak view. On the ambition question, I guess myself, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to instill just blind ambition in my children, uh, despite my uh, reputation. Um, but uh, for me, I think it's an interesting question, which is how do you instill uh, self-motivation? And I think it's absolutely true uh, on the chill out point that I think some people are going to be inherently self-motivated. My husband had the laxest parents, nothing, and very, very, just some people are sort of driven for one reason or the other. Um, but having said that, I do think that parents can play a role. I sort of see it more as um, it being inspiring. There have been so many times both my girls have come and said, I'm bad at this, whether it's in music or school, and just being, blah, I hate this. And I think it's, a, a, it's too romantic to assume that everybody is either self-motivated and driven or not. Again, that's a little bit a bleak view. I think I'm actually an optimist. I feel like when you get good at things, when you work at things, you often discover, oh my God, I, it's, this is more fun than I thought. So that's where I see uh, parenting feeding into the motivation issue. Frank, can I just ask you, as a sociologist, there's um, quite a lot of evidence um, that it's the peer group that affects children and their values quite a lot more than parenting. Is that something you could, in answer to that question up there, how do you instill ambition? Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's really important that quite often it's the children your son or daughter hangs out with that becomes really critical because if you can create the right dynamic, if, for example, if you're, I, I've got a 15 year old boy and it just so happens that although I'm a, a slothful slack father, his friends are all- 13 in, books, can I remind you? Uh, are, <laughs> His, his friends are all into reading, and therefore it's really cool to read books, and it's really you know interesting to you know for them to be academically involved, and it's to do with the fact that that peer group is for some reason I don't understand why has moved in that trajectory, and it seems to me that peer pressure is really a very creative, very constructive dynamic in a children's experience, irreplaceable in many ways, but there's one thing that parents can do, um, and 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 seems to work not so much instill ambition, but to continually 
send out the signal of raising expectations. I think that when children learn from a very early age on that, a lot of, that everything is possible for them, that we think that there are no limits, that the bar is, is set fairly high, that even if they lack motivation themselves, even if they're not that driven, nevertheless, you know, they will play the role. And I think that's, a, that's an important thing that we've learned. And one thing that I, I learned when I was doing my interviews is after a while, you could pretty much tell which children would do well in school compared to other children in the same socioeconomic circumstances. And the, and the single most important variable wasn't parenting skills. It wasn't the fact that mom stood on her head and kind of sped out five P pieces. It was the fact that uh, there's a very clear expectation uh, that anything is possible. And I think that was the key element. And that's something that teachers have learned and other people have learned as being quite important. It's, it's the milieu we create for our kids rather than what we actually do that's important. Thank you. Justine. I, I agree with all that. I think those questions have brought up, um, dare I say, two of the sort of vulnerable spots of the Western parent. Uh, and one is our tendency in the past to um, indulge in sort of pointless praise. Uh, you know, the scribble comes, someone scribbled a drawing, and you say, that's marvellous, darling, I'll pin it on the fridge. Um, uh, which has created a sort of praise junkie culture, and it sort of makes, renders all effort pointless and all achievement redundant. Um, so I think we are a bit vulnerable to that, and we do say in our book, judicious praise is what you should be aiming for if you want your child to really value um, what they do. And the other thing is I think we are all a little bit guilty of wanting our kids to be our best friends and therefore um, perhaps thinking that we're not the boss in the house and we can't make the rules and that then gets you into situations where you can't remove them from Club Penguin. Um, so, so I do think, you know, they're very good questions and I think we have to guard very carefully against those two practices uh, in our Western parenting world. Thank you. Can we take some more questions? Um, lady here in the striped jumper, um, lady in the front row, and person right at the back. Yes. Do start. Uh, okay. This question's for Amy. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, crazy U.S. college admissions process. Uh, could you be a little oh, bit more specific? I um, mean, that, that could be a really long lecture. <laughs> So, uh, you know, schools publish data about how test scores are getting higher and higher, which uh, you could conclude would mean that applicants are more and more talented. But in my opinion, it's the same beleaguered kids running faster and faster to stay in the same okay. place. The nature of the U.S. rat race. Thank you. Yes, the lady in front. Hello, Jana Peel. Just wanted to ask the speakers how they would respond to the statement, which may be a corollary of questions we've heard or of the motion itself, uh, that Western children don't know how to respect their parents. <laughs> Thank you. And lady at the back. I'd yes. I'd like to ask Amy a question. Uh, Rosalind Portman from Family Links, and we deliver a nurturing program through uh, trained facilitators around the UK. And the outcome from our groups is that parents say for the first time they can enjoy being parents because they learn to set boundaries and they learn to be in charge of their children. And I was wondering, Amy, if parenting education has crept into China and if um, Chinese parents would welcome an opportunity. Thank you. Um, Amy, do you want to start with that question? Is there too much pressure in the college rat race now? Um... Well, first of all, I just have to, unlike a couple of my co-panelists, I really, you know, did just write a memoir. So I am not a child psychologist or an education <laughs> expert or a sociologist. Um, I have tons of expertise uh, on those other two books I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but just all I can talk about is, uh, with a, is that I completely agree that the college admissions process is absurd. I mean, I just think it's at so many different levels. Um, and I don't even know where to begin. Um, I, I feel like something is broke with the system. There, there's a movie, a film, documentary film called Race to Nowhere in the States where it shows that uh, teenagers in the United States are so stressed out about this that they're uh, you know, on medication and they get ulcers and they have to cheat. And I feel, what I really feel about this is that there's um, a little bit of a schizophrenia among 
Western parenting, which is we, we're very ambivalent about it in the West. So from ages zero to about 14 or 15, you want to tell your children, we don't care about grades. Don't focus on those things. No pressure. Pursue your passions. You know, we, we're not going to be uh, hierarchical and authoritative. And then my daughter, Sophia, says around sophomore year in high schools everywhere, suddenly you meet the college counselor. And he hands to you all these stats. And these are all the numbers that you need, the GPA and the SAT scores. And by the way, here are all the colleges that you already can't get into. <laughs> you know? And then no wonder at that point, these teenagers are scrambling. They, they're stressed out. They, they don't have the work skills, too. So I could go on and on about that. But I really do think that there's a, a real a, a problem that is not productive there. And I guess the other question was the um, Chinese, do they need parenting education? Uh, I, I do think that the Chinese do, um, they need a lot of things. <laughs> um, and I, I, again, I'm not an expert. Um, for me, it's more interesting how much this anxiety about parenting has to do, I think, with privilege. And, uh, you know, if you're somebody starving, you know, you're in the, uh, like my own parents, or, or you know, uh, the Great Depression, or if you come over as an immigrant, you have no money, um, you just don't have time to, to look for parenting guides and to worry about that. You know, it's just all about survival. So I think that China is much more interesting in parenting now, partly because of increased affluence. And they, in a way, have the luxury to worry about which method is best. And I think what they are trying to do is exactly, and this is the flip side of what Justine is saying. You know, I think they do need to learn more in some ways. Uh, they probably do need counseling. They don't have a strong child psychology uh, a, a tradition there. How to communicate love, you know, how to listen to children better. I mean, there are a lot of scarred kids from, uh, from too much strictness. So, um, but again, I don't want to speak because I don't have any empirical evidence about that. Frank, um, a quick answer. Do you, Western children have insufficient respect for their parents? I think they do. I, I think that usually they, the respect that uh, parents get from their children is proportional to the extent to which they deserve it. And it's... And it's <laughs> And it, and it seems to me that respect is something you earn. You don't get as an automatic right. And that's one of the dynamic aspects of a good child-parent relationship. Thank you. Justine, do you want to come back on that? Yep, no, I agree with that. I think, you know, much as we would love to uh, retreat into Victorian times where children were, not, were seen and not heard, or, you know, perhaps our own generation where... We thought, um, you know, we were often told, because I said so, go to your room. I think we have entered the age of reasoning, and, but that good, the flip side of that is your kids will genuinely respect you, not just because that's the way they had to play, behave when they came out of the womb. So uh, I think uh, if, if you can bear to reason and fight the argument and uh, give them that time, then ultimately they're more likely to respect the outcome. Thank you. Um, Anthony, you wanted to come return to some earlier point. Yes, uh, just uh, uh, a little thing about uh, mental health. Um, we in Britain, uh, our adolescents and young uh, people, lead the world in taking overdoses, um, not in suicide. I don't know whether this is a reflection of the general level of competence, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty strong statistic, that one. <laughs> However, we are far in advance, uh, and I personally examined 15, 000, about 15,000 people who had, who had done it. Is that children or...? Sorry? Is that children? Uh, adoles adolescents and young adults. Yes, recently children. Um, I think we've got time, I'm afraid, for one more random question. Um, the gentleman there with the grey hair. Thank you, Christopher Martin. I am... I am grey-haired and about 50 years older than anybody else here tonight, I think. Um, I was for 20 years a headmaster of um, a number of schools um, and was at one point responsible for 1,200 young adolescents all swimming energetically in the hormonal cauldron. Um, my question is for Frank and Justine. Do you feel it's significant that in all that time I never once encountered a parent who didn't agree wholeheartedly, in theory, initially, with the school's disciplinary framework as outlined to them. But in very many cases, almost half, I would think, um, uh, objected violently and sometimes energetically when the, the disciplinary framework was applied to them or their children personally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And the question uh, up there. Yeah, hi, Rosie Millard. I've got four children. And if Viv 
thinks that's uh, uh, three is one too many. Let me tell you that four is an awful lot. Um, this is a really a question to Anthony, who hasn't picked up on the fact that that the fact that British parents turn into tiger parents largely because the school situation here is so terribly skewed. And if you can't afford to get your child into a private school, let me tell you, you will become a tiger parent desperate to get your child into a state selective school or a half decent school. You will be there with the tutors, with the Kumon, with the this and that, with the violin and all that kind of stuff. Because if your child isn't in that school, the wish for ambition, as the other lady pointed out, the wish for social success, the peer group pressure, all of that, you can forget it because you won't get it in the other sort of schools that your child will end up going to. Rosie, thank you. OK, we'll have the, the last one. Hello, um, I'm Goda. I'm a writer and a mother for a little six-year-old girl. And my question is, how do we balance parenting skills for the current state of youth and the future of future of our nations due to underachieving children with no pressure parenting theories, underpaid teachers, and scheme axing councils who always trim down money from the school's piggy bank? So how do you suggest you know, doing parenting and balancing things out without being a tiger mom? Thank you. Thank you. you. Well, that's one, that's one enormous topic for a final round. Um, I'm going to have to ask um, the panel to um, respond to those very quickly indeed. Um, British parents turning into tiger parents, I think Justine, I think you could answer that one, as well as Anthony. Uh, well, I have, to, I have enormous sympathy with the school's argument. I mean, I think um, there, is, um, there is that moment when, and we've discussed it here tonight, the peer group is so important, and you, you look at the local... Um, state secondary and, and they're essentially carrying knives and, and you know it's gangland and you do realise at that point you probably do have to be a, a little bit more tigerish than you'd wished um, so I'm totally on board with that and I think it's a shame and obviously it's a wider social issue uh, and to the lovely headmaster who um, who talked about um, parents in his school. Well, you know, parental bias is never going to go away, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, we're all short-sighted when it comes to our children. And I'm just going to ask you to address the tiger parents, because I think we'll take that wider issue and hope that you, t you take it in your um, concluding remarks, the four of you. Uh, yes, I, I mean, the, situ the educational situation in this country is uh, disgraceful, and uh, it isn't a question of money, because we now spend four times as much per head <laughs> as we did in 1950 in real terms, uh, but our rate of illiteracy is, if, if anything, higher than it was then. And I don't, think money can, I don't think money can explain that. I worked in an area where I noticed a very big difference between the children of Indian immigrants and uh, white uh, children, and, and also West Indian uh, children, West Indian and there was this huge difference, so that even where the schools were very bad, there was a difference in the results because of the uh, wishes of the parents. So I think what we can see is that this, this terrible peer pressure also comes from the culture that the parents themselves have. And I don't, if I might just say, I don't think it's true that, uh, that parents at one time would have responded to the headmaster's strictures in the way that they now do. I think that has changed. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that the panel will be able to address that question of um, what do we do about the general underachieving level of British education in, in the face of cuts within their two-minute final speeches, because what's going to happen now is that the ushers are coming round with the ballot boxes for the final vote. Can I just remind you again, so you either drop in four or against, or if you're still in doubt, drop your entire ticket into the box. Um, and we're just going to start now with the concluding speeches. And the first person speaker is going to be Frank. So can you, whisk, can you keep a whispering to your neighbours until 10 minutes' time, please? Yes, I will dare. Yes, Frank. Could you all just be quiet, please, while we listen? Oi, I want some respect. <laughs> right, I, I just want to end with the, uh, on the question that was read by the headmaster, which is this. The reason why parents have become so 
uh, sort of uh, promiscuous in tolerating bad behavior by the children in school. And the reason why they don't back up teachers is because there's been a lot of pressure on parents to assume the burden of their children's education. You know, my parents never did homework with me. Uh, and if my parents had done some homework with me, that, would, that, that used to be called cheating. <laughs> Today, it's seen as a sign of responsibility. Responsible parents do homework with their children. You know, when little Mary gets her grade, then it's not just simply Mary who's being examined, her parent is being examined. And if she does well, that reflects on the parent. If she does poorly, then it's a condemnation of that parent. So it's not surprising that parents have become advocates of their child and have lost the capacity to distance themselves from the real objective needs of both the school and of the child. Which really brings me to the central problem that we're confronted with, Asia and Europe. And the problem is, is that because of all these pressures that we've been discussing, parents and adults in general live so much of their life through their child. They recycle so much of their emotion through children that they've lost the capacity to just simply ask the question, is this really in my interest or in the interest of the child? Because the moment we begin to ask that question, is it whose interest is this, the parent will at that point decide that teachers should be backed up rather than the child. And it seems to me that all the problems that we'll be discussing have got nothing to do with parenting. They've got to do with the cultural pressures that are upon the parents, where parents are asked to pick up the pieces that have been caused anywhere else. And I just one final point. I don't know what's the best way of bringing up a child, and I don't particularly care how you do it, as long as you're happy with that. But the one thing that I do know that we learned throughout the centuries and that is that the principal accomplishment of child rearing, of really good child rearing, the principal accomplishment of that is the capacity to prepare your children for independence. And if you've done that, and if you made your child genuinely independent, then you've done a good job. And that's really what we should be assessing rather than all these other stuff. Much, Frank, though, forgive me, that seemed to be an argument for the other side. No. Western parents not so good at parenting, but never mind, Theodore. Uh, well, I, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased that Frank agrees with us so much. I will. I'll, I'll make it even briefer. I think the, uh, if I may say, the real problem that I see is that people do not make a distinction between self esteem and self respect. And self-esteem is something that people feel that they are entitled to, and it's a kind of human right, whereas self-respect is something uh, that you earn and is other-regarding. And on the whole, I think we have instilled, and I'm, of course, speaking grosso modo, uh, we have instilled too, uh, too great an idea that people should be filled with self-esteem when actually what people need is self-respect. And that is where our, 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 um, uh, our child-rearing is, I think, uh, rather deficient. Not in every case. OK, now you've all voted. I can come out for it. No. Um, so so uh, for, I just want to say very quickly, I want to say a word for the youth. Um, our teens, they volunteer more than any other sector in society. Nine out of ten believe schoolwork is important. They're not all hoodied, terrifying, knife-wielding, rap music kind of singers. Um, you know, I had a TV in my room. Um, I very rarely ate a family meal, and when I did, they were hideous. I mean... <laughs> You know, it was just a control freakery thing by my dad. Um, so I think um, we should all relax a bit. I think if your child is going through a thing, it's probably only a phase. I think parenting is horses for courses. And above all, I think we should maintain a sense of humour. Most of parenting, although it's very hard work uh, when, it's, when you're kept up late at night, is quite amusing, possibly with the exception of violin practice, and head lice.
Well, I agree with so much of uh, what everybody said, including the opposition. Um, the, the chilling, and also I think it's important to have a sense of humor about, uh, about parenting, which is uh, partly I, one reason I really like Justine's book. I actually think uh, just to be able to laugh at our own, own mistakes. But I wanted to end with one anecdote, which relates to the last two questions about how do we how can we not be tiger moms given the state of things? And this is from the United States, but one of the more touching emails, I, uh, I've had a lot like this, but I remembered this one because it said, she wrote me and she said, I may sound totally different from you, but I think I'm a tiger mom. I am Irish Polish, I am a single mom, I am a cop, and I work two jobs, and I don't get home till 8.30 p.m., so I couldn't possibly do math and violin and piano with my kids, but I think that I'm a tiger mom. And the reason for that is because when I drag myself home at 8.30, I tell my daughters, let me see those homework assignments, I look at the tests, I say, why did you miss those? Who are your friends? No, you can't go out with those people. No, you can't date that guy. And she said, I was known as the meanest mom in the neighborhood, and it was a bad neighborhood. And I did this, I did this because I myself got pregnant at 15, and I suffered through a lot of misery. And I didn't want that for my girls, and I'm proud because I broke the cycle. Both my daughters went to college. I was a tiger mom, and I broke the cycle. So I think that's just to the point of, oh, is it all about ourselves, or is it for our kids? I think parents, maybe not always, but parents can sometimes make a huge difference. And when you make that difference, I think that's when you get the kind of feeling that I have. As an adult, when you look back, when you're a kid, you're cranky, why are you so mean? But as an adult, you look back and you think, oh my God, I have a great life now, and I owe my parents everything. So I think we should owe, I think we should assume strength rather than fragility in our children. And I think that we in the West totally agreeing with Justine, without going to the extreme of Asia, they have all maybe more problems than we do, but without going to that extreme, I think that we in the West can ask a little more of our children and that they will not only respond to that challenge, but thrive. Thank you. We're still waiting for the very speedy um, tellers to come in with the result of the vote. So um, while we're waiting there, I just wanted to raise the question of the lady up at the top. I feel rather guilty about that. She was asking whether we should be worried that at a time of economic stringency, we're going to end up with um, less money available to teach skills to children. And um, I think that matters a great deal, partly because of some research that I came across last week, um, which is done by a famous Nobel Prize winning economist, James Heckman in America. And he was quoting a famous study done 40 years ago amongst um, deprived three and four year olds, which took kids who didn't have order and structure in their lives and taught them to do the kind of things that tiger parents do and a lot of middle class parents do automatically, which is to all plan what you're going to do, do it and then review it. And it's quite a simple program, but it's very intensive. 40 years later, the children who had been through that program, who were children with below average IQs from very deprived backgrounds were earning more had more chance of owning their own home, were less likely to be pregnant or obese, um, and can't remember the other characters, or had, had committed far fewer crimes than the control group of children who hadn't had that kind of practice. Now, that is exactly the kind of um, thing that the Sure Start programme was originally meant to do in Britain, and of course there's now going to be a lot less money available for that kind of programme. So I'd just like to ask the panel whether they're worried that it may not be the middle classes, the kind of people who are represented here tonight, um, who are really going to be troubled about the fine distinctions between tiger parenting and authoritative parenting on the other, but are a whole lot of kids going to suffer if we don't have that kind of training available? Amy, I wondered what your view was. Um, well, I... I don't know the Britain system too much, but that was in a way part of my anecdote about the, the Irish Polish single mom. I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to drive home, that um, some people just don't have a choice. You know, they don't have the same amount of choices. And um, if you're not gonna get it from society, um, you kind of have to do it yourself. And the, the, I just don't know your system well enough. For me, the parallel is the American story. It's that first generation of immigrants. Among, I have had so many mean, mean emails, but among the very supportive emails, it's surprising. I, they're disproportionate from first-generation immigrants' kids. So kids from, you know, my mom was from, my parents are from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Jamaica, from Haiti. No money. 
Um, uh, but these were even luckier in some ways than the kids you're talking about because they came with sort of education in their heads, you know. But still, no money, no resources. And these are, I found, these are where the tiger parents are concentrated in some ways because they really have no choice. You know, they, they want their children to be able to survive, uh, have a better life, and uh, there's not a lot of luxury, nobody they can hire, they gotta do it themselves. Theodore, are you worried about the cuts? Um, well, I'm not worried about the cuts. I'm worried about the deep uh, corruption of our public administration. Um, <laughs> that sounds like quite a tangent. <laughs> because the vast majority of what passes for public expenditure has no connection with any ostensible purpose, as I know from working in the National Health Service. <laughs> and therefore, when the cuts come, I can assure you that it will not be to those parts of the uh, organization uh, that are not needed. It'll be to those parts of the organization that are needed. And uh, if you count that as being worried, well, then I'm worried. Thank you. I think I'll count that as worry at a very deep <laughs> level. Um, Justine. I actually think there is, um, you know, it, when you're talking about people who um, are stuck in the lower echelons and have very little ambition, um, how you're going to get those children out of those echelons, then I do think actually parenting, that is where I think parenting really does matter. Um, when you haven't got the peer groups around, you haven't got, um, you know, the, the, the sort of learned history of parents teaching parents how to parent. And that's where I think government does need to intervene. I think if you look at um, kids who are failing from families who are, you know, in poor socioeconomic classes and having very little um, success generationally, um, then, you know, you find that one of the things is they, they just don't praise their kids at all. There's a lot of negative vibes. And just having a class which says this is the value of being positive and not negative, yeah. um, you know, could be incredibly helpful. So I don't think it takes a lot of money, but I think it would be very useful. Frank, a final word before we discover the result. Yeah, I think all the evidence shows that parenting classes, Sure Start, any of these programs simply don't work. And I don't think there's any uh, magical reason for that. The reason for that is that there are things in life that you have to learn but cannot be taught. Right. You have to learn how to have good relationships, but at the end of the day, that's not something that, something that somebody else can teach you. And the problem that we have in our society is not that there aren't enough Sure Start programs or parenting classes, because I think they, are, they, they, they really are about socializing parents rather than children. That's really what their objective is. The real problem is that we don't provide people from poorer backgrounds with stimulating educational opportunities. That if you go into some schools in this country, it's like, you know, sort of a dead end as far as the children are concerned. That right from the very beginning, there's an assumption that they're going to fail in life. And instead of trying to solve a, a, a wide social and cultural problem with the parent, which is entirely inappropriate, we should look at the wider community setting and see what we can do there to create a better opportunities for children to be stimulated and challenged in the way that's not the case at the moment. Thank you very much. And now, I'd, and now I'd just like to um, announce the final result, which I think is rather astonishing. I'd like to remind you that before the debate, 149 people voted for the motion, 325 were against, and the don't knows amounted to 194. Well, minds have really been changed, because now it's 315 for the motion, 280 against, and only 59 don't knows. So I'd just like to say thank you all for coming and to the panel for being such a lively group.